This is Ecotricity's Ecotech Roundup Show from Aotearoa's only carbon zero certified renewable electricity company. We only source from wind, hydro and solar and we are the leading supplier of electricity to electric vehicles in Aotearoa. Switch today at ecotricity.co.nz. Welcome back to another roundup in the world of clean cars and green energy. Thanks for joining me. Tesla released its official third quarter figures at the close of business local time on Wednesday, so Thursday afternoon Kiwi time, setting new records across the board. Tesla set a new quarterly production record of 365,923 cars, as well as set a new delivery quarter record of 343,830 vehicles. This combined with a massive increase in deployed energy storage, nearly double that of last quarter, gave Tesla its best revenue to date of 21.5 billion US dollars and an adjusted earnings per share of $1.05. While the earnings beat expectations, revenue fell short by a half billion dollars, something which did affect Tesla's share price during trading on Thursday. More is coming from Tesla's quarterly earnings call, so keep your ears peeled later in the show. If you've been in the market for a new-to-you electric car this year, and many of you have reached out to tell us just that, you'll know that used EV prices have been very high of late. But EV sales data analysed by specialist firm Recurrent Auto shows that, for the US at least, used electric vehicle prices are beginning to stabilise. Tracking values of 2017 through 2019 electric cars like the Chevy Bolt EV, BMW i3, Tesla Model S and more, Recurrent's in-house price index shows that there's a general softening in used EV prices. While prices are falling just as used internal combustion engine car sale prices are falling, the rate of decline in used car prices is slower for EVs than ICE vehicles. With a new US federal tax credits, including incentives for used EVs, expected demand for used EVs to remain higher than in previous years. It was the Paris Motor Show this week, and at it we saw plenty of new cars debut, including the new Mercedes-Benz EQE SUV and AMG EQE SUV. As the name suggests, both vehicles, one regular and one given a sportier tune, are SUV variants of the recently launched EQE sedan, and with a little more inside room for passengers and their luggage. But unlike the EQS SUV, which has an extra row of seats, over the EQS, the EQE SUV is, like the EQE sedan, a five-seater. With over 30 pages of press material for these vehicles alone, I can't go into everything detailed, but I do know that it will be offered in rear-wheel drive or all-wheel drive configuration, come with plug and charge, 170 kilowatt DC quick charge capabilities, and a very high-end price tag. As for the AMG variant, well, it'll offer up to 677 horsepower. Elon Musk was present at this week's third quarter earnings call for Tesla and as a consequence we learned a lot about the future plans the company has for products and software. And during the call Elon Musk dropped the bombshell that Tesla won't be getting regulatory approval for its full self-driving software before the end of this year, meaning it'll be next year at the earliest before it can flip the switch on FSD and take it out of beta. While it's bound to disappoint owners and fans alike who had hoped Tesla would be able to jump through those regulatory hoops and make Elon's promise come true, those who've been following autonomous vehicle regulations will be able to tell you that, right now in the US at least, there's not a real framework for defining autonomous vehicle operation. For now then, I think level two is about all I think we'll get. The rest is still tied up in red tape. At the Paris Motor Show this week, Stellantis showed its first ever all-electric Jeep in the form of a Jeep Avenger, a two-wheel drive B-segment crossover. That's subcompact. While the design is unmistakably Jeep, complete with flared wheel arches, decent ground clearance, off-road modes and Jeep family grille, the spec sheets aren't very impressive, especially for a car that will launch as a European market 2024 model year vehicle. With 115 kilowatt motor powered by a 54 kilowatt hour pack, Stellantis says the Jeep Avenger will manage 400 kilometers, 249 miles on the combined WLTP cycle. Real world figures will be about 80% of that. Jeep also unveiled a concept all wheel drive electric Avenger, but said nothing of its specifications, at least 
Not yet. While the European auto industry was all in Paris this week, GMC surprised everyone by revealing a new electric vehicle for the US market, the Sierra EV Denali. Built on the same platform as the Hummer EV and the Chevrolet Silverado EV, the GMC Sierra EV Denali is an all-electric pickup truck that's designed to appeal to luxury truck buyers who don't want an over-the-top machismo vehicle that's found in the Hummer EV or the weekend outdoorsy vibes of the Silverado. EV. Thanks to the Ultium platform, it has 800 volt battery technology, up to 350 kilowatts DC quick charging, and all wheel steering. That does include crab mode, as well as 400 miles, 640 kilometers of range per charge. GMC also promises that you could run your home for at least 20 days off the truck, but that feels like a stretch. Pricing hasn't been released, but as it's a Denali, it will be expensive. For a long time, Tesla talked up the idea of making affordable $25,000 cars for the masses. But in recent years, that idea has taken a backseat, replaced instead by pursuit of robo-taxis, ramping up Model Y production, and more recently, Optimus. But during Wednesday's earnings call, Elon Musk announced that the engineering team at Tesla are now starting work on a next-generation electric car platform that he says will cost about half the price of the current Model 3 and Model Y platform to make. This vehicle, he said, would make it possible to build smaller sized vehicles, resulting in a more affordable price tag for customers, since the next generation platform being promised would cost a lot less to produce. I would love to see a more affordable Tesla come to market, but history doesn't bode well when it comes to Tesla delivering on its low cost car promises. Kia has officially priced its mid-cycle refresh of the Kia Niro EV for the US market, and while the vehicle gets some welcome tweaks, its sticker price is a bit high. The entry-level Kia Niro EV Wind starts at $40,745, which includes $1,295 of destination charges and fees, and features 17-inch alloy wheels, automatic LED headlights, heated mirror, automatic wipers, privacy glass, and a power liftgate. Meanwhile, the more expensive Wave trim adds fancier headlights with fog lights, power folding mirrors, sunroof, and power-adjustable passenger seat, plus heated steering wheel and vehicle-to-load inverter. It it commands a starting price of $45,745, again with delivery charges and fees included. But the big issue here is the fact that the Chevrolet Bolt EUV costs far less. That said, I would argue that the Nero EV is a far better car. At the Paris Motor Show this week, Renault showcased its latest concept vehicle in the form of the Renault Forever Trophy, a modern, electrified take on the original iconic Renault 4 that previews a production Renault 4 SUV sometime in 2025. While the stand had plenty of EVs on it, Renault CEO Luca De Meo appeared cautious about the progress being made in the EV industry, commenting that he doesn't believe electric vehicles and internal combustion engine vehicles will reach cost parity anytime soon. He cites rising prices for raw materials used in EV battery packs, not to mention ongoing parts shortages. While the industry had predicted that the cost per kilowatt hour for most battery packs would fall by $100 within five years, that hasn't happened across the board yet. I hope he's wrong, though, because time is running out for that particular transition. Looping back to Tesla's quarterly earnings, another big piece of news from the earnings call, and look, there's plenty that we don't have time to cover today, was the fact that Tesla is aiming to produce 50,000 Tesla semis per year as early as 2024. If Tesla manages it, it would leapfrog much of the big rig competition, as many mainstream truck companies making electric trucks are producing a fraction of that number at current time. While Tesla had originally planned to use 4680 form factor cells, that apparently isn't the case, Musk confirmed during the call, at least for now. Tesla Semi isn't using those new battery cells. If I guess, it probably means that Tesla is using 2170 cells instead, which in turn would allow it to make more trucks. That said, I do expect Tesla to switch to 4680 form factor cells at some point in the near future. Before we get to the last two stories, a quick question. Are you in the market for a new electric car? If you are, 
and you live in Atayara, you should totally check out our very own buyer's guide at ecotricity.co.nz. It is packed with all the information you need to pick a car that's right for you and includes plenty of details about charging providers you can charge up with, cars you can buy, incentives you can get, and of course, how to get clean, green, renewable power at home. So follow the link below and start your journey today. Unless you've been hiding in a cave for the last few months, I think it's impossible not to notice that the politics in the UK have been a little... a little wonky of late. The actions of the current government and the just-resigned Prime Minister Truss, who this week broke a new record for being the shortest-term PM in history, has caused the UK economy to go into freefall, which, when you combine with Brexit, means companies are fleeing. This week, Mini confirmed it would be ceasing production of the all-electric Mini models in the UK, choosing instead to shift production to both Germany and China. The reasons? Well, mild BMW executives were diplomatic about the move, stating the company felt the original Cowley plant, where the very first Morris Minis were made, isn't geared up for electric vehicles. I cannot help but think that the actions of the UK government are to blame. What say you? And finally, at CES 2020, Kate Walton, Elliot and I got to see the Manta 5 XE1, a hydrofoil electric human hybrid that was unlike anything that we'd seen before. And Kate got to try it because I fell off a stage and I wasn't in a safe place to ride. She also fell off a fair few times. Now, the Kiwi company behind it has unveiled a brand new model, the SL3. Based on the same technology, this variant features a throttle like many electric bicycles do, which means the hardest part about getting riding, getting going, is a lot easier because you can use the throttle to give you a little boost up out of the water. Manta 5 says the learning curve for this new model is about 40 minutes versus three hours for its predecessor, and frankly, I am super keen to give this a go. Just don't expect this to be electric bicycle cheap because the previous model was about 8,000 US dollars. But compare that to, say, a jet ski, and I think it's super affordable and a lot better for your overall health and fitness. And on that note, we are done for today. But before I go, do make sure that you have hit the notification bell so you don't miss out on the latest in EV news from this channel. And if you haven't already switched, why not switch to Aotearoa's only Carbon Zero certified renewable electricity company? It is super easy to make the switch, and in doing so, you will help wean the nation off dirty energy and onto clean, green power that will keep the land beautiful for generations to come. I'll be back with more awesome content very soon, as will the lovely Gavin Kiwi EV Shoebridge, and I'll be back here next weekend for our usual roundup show. Enjoy the rest of your day. I'm Nikki Gordon Bloomfield. Kakite! See you next time.